my name is Lori Brockman. I teach in the business school, Marketing Management 300. And I'm here to talk about my life with student response systems or how I'm learning to love Top Hat. Um, we started out with a couple of quick questions. Um, I'm usually uh, expecting to deal with 200 people, so this will be an interesting graph, but I thought we could take a look. <laughs> this is actually the widget. Um, I don't know, you can't really see it, but uh, let's see if we can't get this to work. So, a whopping five people said that they have never used Top Hat, but they're considering using it. Um, a few said I use Top Hat, but to the, not to the extent I probably should. And one is here to mock me, so thanks so much. Um, appreciate that. Uh, that was Amy. <laughs> I know who you are, by the way. <laughs> just so you know. Um, all right, we've got a couple. We've got a real mix on class size, over 100 students, which is similar to what I teach, 50 to 99. Also, a pretty good good size class, um, under 25, and maybe not teaching right now. None of the above. All right, so. Those are the first two questions, and normally they're pretty technical. I, we're having kind of a more, I would say, operator error on the podium, as opposed to actual technology issues here. So I just wanted to show you, these are actually pretty easy. We'll do a live one in a minute. My background is uh, marketing management, and maybe this is for some of you who also have large courses. My course is a requirement in the business school. So students who are already in the business school, or some who are trying to get into the business school, take my course and have to do well in it. I average about six to 700 students a semester across three lectures. Um, and only about 15% of those students are going to be marketing majors. So the other 85% are looking for the, getting the most out of the least effort, essentially. How can I get through this class, get a great grade, but really focus on the, the major that I want to focus on? So I have been struggling for quite a few years now on how to create involvement and value in a large lecture. And I think for some of us who deal with large lectures, uh, you've probably had this sort of nightmare scenario that I have been plagued with for the past few years, so let me share it with you. Um, you know, large lectures are kind of going the way of the dinosaur. Um, if, if you can't figure out how to add value, it doesn't vary that from on an online course. If they're just going to go in, listen to something, take notes, and take an exam, what are you adding? So trying to figure out as classes are getting larger, how to get some sort of smaller class interaction in a larger class. And I've been using uh, student response uh, tools for about 10 years. I started at a different school with a new, uh, something called uh, response innovations and or turning turning point moved to iClicker. Overall experience was about a C to a D minus. <coughs> I was hoping to do a lot of things and really ended up with glorified attendance systems. Mm. Um, they couldn't really do a whole lot else. At least scale to what I needed it to do. So I still have the class challenges of in general. A lot of people aren't really interested in the subject, but they have to take the course. Um, it's a really big lecture hall, uh, 250 students to 275, so they can be really safe about checking out if they're in the back. It's oftentimes, especially when I get to my last lecture, that may be the student's fourth or fifth class of the day. Sometimes I have students that say, this is my fourth class in this large lecture hall today. Oh, gosh. Um, so good for them that they're still even there. Um, and there's a lot of distractions from personal electronics, so you're competing with the, you know, all kinds of stuff. And I have got a growing number of English as second language students, so the sort of an anonymity of a large lecture and then having to pick up you know, information coming at you quickly is tough for them, tough for anybody. So as I looked at how can I continue with student response systems, I had laid out a couple of objectives. And I wanted to find a technology that you know, reliably captured correct responses. I had issues with that in the past. And typically, there were so many glitches due to a number of different reasons that I became correct answer monitor and had lots of students coming to me saying, I answered it correctly. Can you go back and change it? Well, when you have 700 students, 30 or 50 every lecture saying, go back in and change an individual record, that becomes your job. And I don't want that job. Um, 
So I, wanted, I also wanted to find a technology that's pretty easy to integrate into the course and has a really low learning curve, both for me and for my students. And I wanted to find a solution that has really good customer service. Students will always have issues. You'll always have something you want to try. It's good to be able to have a key person that's always available on the phone or is going to get back to you right away and help you figure something out. Um, as far as learning, I wanted to find a technology that encourages students to achieve better results. And I actually integrated this with a couple of other course changes, and I'll show you how I did that. Um, I find a technology that encourages more collaboration and engagement, and one that students actually value. They don't just see as sort of a busy work thing that they have to buy. Um, so I switched to the top hat in the spring of 15. And a couple of advantages are there are no, there's no really bulky equipment. Um, you don't really see anything here. I sometimes carry a flash drive with me. Um, but unlike iClicker, you don't need a big receiver that you have to hook up in class. It's pretty easy. It uses Wi-Fi. It does use a smartphone. But if students don't have a smartphone, they can text in responses, which is pretty, pretty nice. So they don't have to go out and buy a smartphone if they don't have it, although that's becoming less of an issue. Um, there are a variety of question types and answer display options. Not all of them scale terribly well to large lectures, but you've got the options if you want to use it. And it's now relatively inexpensive. This became the official SRS system for UW last semester, so they were able to negotiate better prices. So a single semester right now is $16. And you can buy a year subscription for 20 or a five-year subscription for 72. Because there's a real split in the business school in terms of who's using iClicker, who's using Top Hat, or, or, or who's using Socratic, I basically tell students, go ahead and buy this one, unless you already know you have a subscription. Mm -hmm. And actually, we were able to get the five-year one down to 54. Oh, cool. Oh, good. Um, I don't know anyone who's personally bought a five-year one, but you know, I tell them, hey, this is fine. You can go here. Probably the biggest issue is students will go in and take the two-week free one and then not be able to figure out how to get on board and how to transfer their information. Mm -hmm. So I strongly discourage them not to do that. Buy it right away unless they have significant concerns about keep staying in the class after two weeks. Um, operationally, I found there's some really, really great strengths. There's less cheating. I clickers you can give to a friend and they can go into lecture and they can answer the questions for you. And I, ha I know I had it going on. I couldn't see students with two eye clickers because that lecture is so far back. But I could tell there weren't 250 people in lecture and what I, yet I was getting responses. Students won't give up a smartphone. They're not going to say, here, take this for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, can't do it. Um, it reliably captures correct responses. I have very few incidences where there's an issue with the correct response. There's good customer service. You probably see the most questions around, how do I do this right at the beginning of the year when students are trying to register? A customer service has been able to handle them really well. And quite frankly, the percentage of students having issues <coughs> is pretty small, um, which is great. Um, there are a lot of ways to track and score responses. You can do correct answers. You can do participation. You can do the same question and give credit, different levels of credit for both of those. Or there's a separate attendance module where you can just take attendance with it if that's all you want to do. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can do it. Um, there's a really low learning curve, at least to get up and running with it. Um, there are some more advanced features that I haven't tried yet, but I'm interested in trying. But I wanted to get the basic blocking and tackling and testing that out in my course before I attempted to do some of those things. <coughs> questions are really easy to create. If you have a class and you had your questions set up and you like it, it's really easy to transfer those questions into a new class at the beginning of the year. You can do it yourself or they'll do it for you. Um, it's easy to work with at a podium, despite my technical issues here. But depend and depending on your learning management system, if you're, if you're using D2L right now, there's an integration in there and into the gradebook that happened this semester. I'm using Moodle, so I can't do that, but it's kind of a non-issue because students can see exactly what their percent wrong or right is by tracking it on their phone or computer, and then I upload at various times of the year so they can sort of see where, where their grade is going. And it's simple to operate. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to add is, is a, an admission on my part. It's really hard to mess it up. Um, if you did 18 secret steps, which nobody ever did except for me, and happened to lose a chunk of data, which I did last semester, they had it back within 10 minutes. It mm -hmm. was like, yeah, we've got a backup system. Don't worry about it. How did you do it? And I explained it. They said, yeah, that's about the only way you could actually do this. No one's ever done that before. I did. <laughs> uh, but it, you know, it was decimal dust. I was able to get it up and running, and I had only a few seconds of, oh my god, what have I done? And I was like, okay, fine. Um, there are a couple of operational weaknesses. Um, there's a few tech issues because it's not fully integrated with Top Hat. This is the little widget that you use that, that pops up on your screen. And occasionally, uh, or what happened last semester is, uh, I believe that PowerPoint made some upgrades. And what would happen is every time I switched slides, this puppy would fall behind. And you'd have to diminish, pull it back out, ask the question. It was very awkward. That's fixed now. I'm not quite sure why it happened. It was just they were out of sync with an update. Not the end of the world, just a little more awkward at the podium. Mm -hmm. um, the way I've been using it is I've been uh, uploading my slides into Top Hat and then toggling back and forth between the questions and the PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. I use the magnify and demagnify. Do you have any experience with why you chose to do it this way versus the other way? Yeah. I use a lot of video and embed. Oh. And in, I can do it that way, yeah. but I have to give my presentation to Top Hat they have to code it and put it into that format, and then I do not have the flexibility to change videos on the fly. Okay, so then is that an app in the top left-hand corner? Mm -hmm. Is that what that is? Okay. Yeah, um, and there's a little widget, and it loads every time I get onto the screen. I open up this file, and it's, it's right there. Okay. Um, and it's, it's very easy to do. Okay. To be honest with you, one of the things that attracted me to Top Hat was the demonstration of they had an iPad, and they were doing exactly what you were doing, and so you could walk around the classroom and go to Top Hat seamlessly and run your PowerPoint. And I have this lecture hall and I thought I can A, quit the gym, and B, walk around the classroom and kind of see who's on hotgirls.com and who isn't, and you know, who's actually you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing on their electronic devices. The video was the stopper. That was the eye opener that said, you can't quite get there yet. But if you don't have that, you do. Uh, did I finish this? Yes. Um, the other thing is assessing open-handed questions or short response questions doesn't scale very well in a really large class. So I'll show you uh, kind of one of, the, one of the issues that I've encountered real quickly. But um, suffice to say there, there are a couple of glitches which are completely manageable in the class of 25 and maybe in that class of 50 to 100. But when you get over that, depending on how you're doing it, it can be kind of a pain. And also, hey, you're not telling kids it's okay to have smartphones in class, so don't kid yourself, especially in big lectures. That's, a temp that's like you know, putting food in front of a starving person. They like it. Um, learning results. Now, this is somewhat anecdotal in terms of what worked. Um, I have, as I said, 250, 250, 150. That's how my lectures play out. Even now, I'm getting over 90% attendance in lectures one and two. That is, even with the fact that I post my video of my lecture online after lecture. Um, I, I did these two things simultaneously. Um, I posted the videos, and it's, they're not terrific videos. I use Camtasia. It, it records my slides and my voiceover, so it's not like I have you know, makeup and cameras and really good lighting, which I like. Um, in, in my classroom, but it gives athletes who are traveling and are going to miss lecture a chance to check. It gives English second language, I speak quickly, you may have noticed the caffeine has kicked in, <laughs> a chance to say, well, I have all, because they have, they have slides, but what were the examples that she gave for the slide? What was she talking about making fast forward and go back and pick that up? So I wanted to do that, but I didn't want to encourage students to say, Man, it's really nice out today, I don't think I'll go to lecture. I can pick that up later. I can pick that up later, I can pick that up later. And all of a sudden it's exam time and they're saying, yeah, I gotta cram 30 hours of lecture 
here just before the exam. So I wanted to give them an incentive to come to class. I use correct answer. They have to get so many um, correct over the course of the semester to get full participation points. So that's their incentive to come to class. Also listening to the lectures on tapes like watching paint dry. I mean, it's not exciting. It's a great backup, but it should never be your primary, at least in my class. Um, so I think that that is actually a pretty impressive statistic. I've taught large lectures, and that, especially at this time of the year, starts to get pretty lean. Uh, exam scores, now again, coupled with the online videos, have improved about two points. I give them a lot of multiple choice questions throughout the course of the year. Um, I open them up for review prior to the exam. They're not the same questions that are on the exam, and they're probably slightly simpler. But I use these questions in class to figure out, is the concept clear? I just covered something important. Let's ask a question about it. Did they get it? Did they hang on my every word? Did, was my prose as eloquent and insightful as I thought it was, or did I lose them? And that, you can see that, and you can then have a quick explanation of this is the, why this one is, this answer is correct and this one is not correct. So I use that tool during lecture, and then I give them that tool to review as a prep for the exam, and that seems to, number one, give value to the students in terms of why they have to buy this thing, and number two, help me clear up some issues before I see them on the exam that, oh, they really didn't understand that point. So my exams actually have gotten more difficult. I have been, I, I do primarily multiple choice of the size of the class, but the nature of those questions are application and higher level thinking as opposed to definition. Um, and I'm able to do that and still see improvement. And I think Top Hat definitely has a piece of that, though it's probably not accounting for all of it. And this one was true really of you know, all of the um, methods that I've used. You can get that quick understanding. Let's ask the question. Oh, here's an old exam question I'm going to put up. The hands will perk up immediately when I do that. Do you understand it? Can you see it? Things that could be improved. This is, a, this is one of those scale things. What brand of Super Bowl ad did you like? Well, T-Mobile, T-Mobile is different. Then T-Mobile is different from a different spelling. So T-Mobile might have come up five different times with a lot of different answers. And unless I go through all 250 of them, I don't get really accurate bar charts. So th this is a word answer as opposed to a multiple choice. And so you get this kind of open end. And they really don't do a great job right now of um, spell check and sort of matching and seeing if it'll make sense. They say that by fall they're working on it. We'll see. Sorting and matching problems are really cool on paper. It takes students a long time and it's sort of physically difficult if they have a smaller screen on their phone to be able to execute one of those in class. You have to, you know, that's like a two minute question. Who has that amount of time? <laughs> um, in a smaller classroom, maybe you could make it work or maybe in some sort of group setting you could make it work. But they haven't, I, I tried a few of them and learned pretty quickly. Numeric, I was hoping to be able to get averages, and it doesn't really do that. It gives you a bar chart of here are all the different numbers people chose. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't really help me as much. So the autocorrect thing is kind of a, an issue for me, and they're, they claim they're working on it. Um, the other thing, the video integration. I wish they could really improve that because, as we talked about a minute ago, I'd love to be able to just take an iPad and walk around my class and get, you know, move forward, move backward, ask a question. With video, they can't quite do it yet. Unless you know for sure you are not going to change a video when your lecture is set. Um, absent students is an issue. You have the ability to, once you've asked a question, to close it out and then open it up for individual students that you may want to say, all right, I know you're going to be absent, you have a medical excuse, I'm opening it up for you for Thursday. What happens though is the other students that have already taken that question, if you're grading them, see, their, see that response disappear. And then the emails start to come in. I know I got it right, I don't see it, what's wrong, how come I can't do it? It's not worth it. Um, how I've gotten around that is I basically tell students, 
I'm going to give you a cushion. You have to get 65% average correct over the course of the semester. That 35% cushion covers excused and unexcused absences, um, wrong, wrong answers, because I want to encourage you to reach material before class. And again, not to slam it two days before the exam. So by saying, if you have to have correct, you have to have a certain percentage, there's an encouragement there to review that material early on. And that's it. And if, a, if your phone fails during that uh, one time, or if it's, you know, your battery dies, that goes to that 35%. Yep. So <clears throat> I, I, I had like an aha moment while you were talking, because we were just looking at using it for participation. Mm -hmm. But I think because you're doing it grading, like correct me if I'm wrong, like, because I was thinking somebody could legitimately be at home and have top that open and wait for the questions to mm -hmm. pop up. But if they don't have the content, then they really are taking a gamble at mm -hmm. whether or not they're going to get that question right. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like by having points assigned for accuracy, that that is what is bringing up your participation? Or do you think you would have gotten that class, you know, enrolled from? participation up either way, if you gave participation points or for accuracy? I think just participation points, they'll try to game the system. Um, okay. I've, I've, I've seen that with others, and it's a very, I have a very competitive class, and I don't want to encourage, such things to encourage wrong behavior, or leave that behavior an option. Mm -hmm. And to me, the correct answer, now that I've found a system, uh, a system that accurately will measure that, yeah. really is encouraging students not to try to fly by the seat of their pants and I'll, I won't read the chapter and I can kind of get by. It's and actually percentage good. drops down. I mean, my percentage is, well, they started, I actually started at a 75% level and then the average was 78. I've dropped it to 65 and now the average is around 70, 72. And right about now, I've got students going, can I miss a class? Where's my average? About how many is she going to ask? Because they want to get their full participation points. It's 15 points out of 500. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I say if you get 65 or above, you get the full 15. If you get 64%, you get 64% times 15 or nine points. So you drop. You want to stay above 65% correct. Would you be willing to share your syllabus at all so I can see your wording? Um, sure. In fact, I have some slides here. We can go okay. through it afterwards. Absolutely. Um, the other bug fixes, they have had some glitches. This is my word cloud right here, um, and that's the size of it right now. They're aware of it. It's been that way for a year, uh, and they claim that they will have at least a partial fix by the fall. They've identified one, one of the contributors to that is my class is very large. Responses can be varied, and that forces a lot of different things. But they have something, obviously, with sizing going on, because I defy you to read this. Um, so that one's taken a while. The widget falling behind the presentation taken a while. And I've had phantom questions open on me, uh, which is a little weird. They, they fixed it. It happened in the summer when they were working on upgrading and they didn't think anybody was teaching. I was teaching. Uh, but occasionally just goofy stuff happens. And that's going to be true really for any tech tool that you take. Stuff's going to happen. You can't just anticipate a perfect. I think, personally, for me, the pluses outweigh the minuses. It's a good tool to keep students engaged. Not completely. They're not all hanging at the edge of their seats, despite how fascinating I am. For me, I think, okay, it's, 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 it's made the first cut. It's an accurate, yes, they have it right. Yes, this concept was understood or not. That was somewhat of a low bar, but one that two other technologies weren't able to do. This one does. If you have LMS, uh, if you have D2L as your LMS, you can now integrate it, that's a plus. I think there's untapped potential. I think there is a way to start using more types of questions and being able to get responses from large lecture. Um, I've had some conversations, early conversations, to try to figure out some new ways to do things. Um, I don't, does anybody need any tips on how to get this up and running? Because I lost the bet, I'm over 10 minutes. <laughs> um, do you, if you don't, a um, couple of key things. I, I'll just tell you anyway. 
tell them up front when you buy, when you're if you've got a textbook or tech materials they have to buy, let them know they're going to have to buy top hat. Don't spring that on them right. They want to know that yes, this is going to be an expense. I would recommend using it as a point worthy element of your syllabus. If it's not, students see it as frivolous. Um, why did I have to, oh, I, if I don't buy this and I just don't participate, it doesn't affect my grade, and they won't. It's got to it's affect the grade. Give a cushion, like it's the 65%, 35%, to not have you become the monitor of all things technical. That one-off battery dying, fine kid, goes to the 35. And don't expect perfection. There's always going to be technical glitches, as we saw here. Um, I require laptops being in the lower bowl. Some kids use their cell phones. Uh, if you're going to use a laptop, I'm not stupid. They're on Facebook. They're on other things. So this is, this is how far away I can get from the podium and get back in time to get a, a video up and not break up my lecture too badly. So they have to sit there. Um, I also tell them the consequences of misusing their phone. Um, I can certainly see when someone in the back row is doing this and there's no question of it. I'll, I, I tell them on day one, I will call you out. I will embarrass you to the absolute extent that I can. And I, you may lose your phone privileges and you will lose your ability to earn these points in class. Does it stop it? No. Right about now, it's going to be, I'll probably give two or three more call-outs, call but it calms it down quite a bit. And students know that they're kind of risking embarrassment. Um, let's try a question. I lost someone, sorry about that. Right, but this is kind of how it works when I'm uh, at the podium. So I'm using this method, and you, know, you have to click this, you hit ask, and it opens up. You guys are going to have 60 seconds. My single biggest concern about adopting Top Hat for my class <laughs> is or was the adoption learning curve for students, the adoption learning curve for me, my time required to deal with tech issues, justifying the cost versus benefits for students, the time required to evaluate and record Top Hat grades and participation, all that admin, or something else. All right, got 28 seconds left. Still waiting. Still waiting. Still All right, I don't think we're there, so I'm going to go ahead and disable this. You can disable this at any time. I had a timer on here. All right, choice. There's the response. That's it. I, I've chosen bar charts, but I could do, uh, let's say, table. There's lots of different things that I can oops, figure out how I want to do this. Um, like, there's a lot of different displays. I've sort of set up my settings to do it this way because that's what I that's what I use a lot. But then, if I were doing like a multiple choice A, B, C, or D, and there was a correct answer there, and I had a lot of people that were incorrect, I could say, okay, here's why this doesn't work. Here's what, you know, or why did you think it was this one? Why did you think it was this one? And try to get responses from the audience. So it looks like we've got a few people that are looking at that adoption learning curve and the time to deal with tech issues. Um, interesting, some other, maybe you guys will share. Uh, time required. So yeah, a lot of the con same, same concerns I think that a lot of us have. Okay, nicely done, guys. You learned. Of course, maybe a lot of you have already used this, I realize. So, any other questions? 